as we as we start to travel along this road in your career, the one thing that we start to see is is two things jump out at me. One, you're a person that likes to take on huge challenges, and two, you know you've been able to consistently take programs from their from their infancy and build them into gigantic winners in that and. And so we can transition into, okay, here you are, you arrive in Washington, D.C., you take over the Maryland basketball program. They hadn't won a, anything since Abe Lincoln was a boy, and you take over the program, and then right away you, you come out with this bold statement that your goal is to make Maryland the UCLA of the East. What, what, was, your, what was your thought process behind that, Coach? Well... You know what it was, but Tom McMillan was the number one player in the country. Mm -hmm. He was on the front of Sports Illustrated, mm -hmm. had a, a A plus average, and he averaged about thirty eight points, forty points a game. And his brother. So when Kehoe was trying to talk me into coming there, he he took me out to lunch with uh, with Jay McMillan, mm -hmm. Tom's brother. And Tom's brother said, he was selling me to, he said, look, Lefty, you can come here and make Maryland and UCLA the East. We're a whole lot like them. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a big city. We're a commuter school just like UCLA. We've got mm -hmm. a great field house. We're playing a great league. Mm -hmm. And I think you can make it to UCLA the East. That was his pitch to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why I said it when I accepted the job. I said, my goal is to make UCLA make Maryland the UCLA at ease because I thought it would help me with Tom, mm -hmm. which it did in the mm -hmm. end. So uh, that's why I, 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 where the UCLA the East stuff came from. It came from Jay McMillan more mm -hmm. than me. And then, Coach, right away, within the first three years you were at Maryland, you were able to uh, recruit the, uh, uh, the number one recruiting class in, 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 in America. When you, with the McMillan, Elmore, Trimble, Porak group, they were ranked the number one uh, freshman team in the country over the, the, the great UCLA team with Bill Walton and those guys. And so how, how were you able to start out so quickly attracting that type of uh, talent to Maryland? Well, you know, because you were there. I mean, you were, I had great assistant in you and Joe Harrington and Jim Maloney, and you know, we just got after people. And uh, once, once we got McMillan, I think he might have been the no, he wasn't because he didn't do it until he came to school. Mm -hmm. He never signed a letter of intent. <clears throat> no. But we got Elmore, who you recruited him a great yeah. deal, and he was a great shot blocker and played for. Powell Memorial, which was the number one high school, high school team, team in the country. country, right? And we got him, and then Jack Trimble was on his team, team right? Who was a great uh, small forward, yeah. But he got hurt; he busted his knee up, mm -hmm. and and then uh, then we got Porak, and you know, I mean, you were right there; you were a big part of it. We were just we just outworked people in recruiting, and uh, I I like to think we outcoached them too. Because that's the way we got Midnight Man to start. You were yeah. there. But because our philosophy was, hey, we're going to start before everybody else and we're going to be playing in the national championship game. Yeah. So, um, you know. Because a lot of people don't understand that you were the originator of Mid Midnight Madness and that. And, and, uh, and, here we are today and people are still copying the concept that you started way back in the, in, in, in the 60s and that. And it was really your idea. I know you, you, you try to deflect a lot of the claim and say it was all of us, but it was really your... When, when you thought about it, what were you... I know, you, I, I remember in the office we were sitting and talking and you said, hey, the NC2A rule says that you can start at, at midnight on October the 15th. And, and, and then you were saying, well, how, how come no one starts at midnight? And we're going to start and we had the players run... And that, so why don't you kind of take it from there? Well, I don't know whose idea. It might have been yours. And, and I mean, we were all sitting around talking yeah. about, you know, this was going to be our first good team. McMillan and Elmore mm -hmm. and those guys were going to be sophomores because mm -hmm. they couldn't play as freshmen. Right. Like that. 
So we said, we, we got to outwork people. That was one of my mm -hmm. my philosophies is the harder you work, the luckier you get. So yes. we will outwork people. And um, so we said, let's run a mile. What we did is you remember, we, we used to run a mile the first day of practice mm -hmm. to make sure that when the guys start practicing, they were in some sort of shape. Sure, yes. So we said, we were, and it messed up our practice. Mm -hmm. like if we were going to practice on October the 15th at 3 o'clock, we ran a mile at 3 o'clock. By the time they got to practice at 3.30 or 4, they were tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the reasons we said, let's just run a mile at, at midnight, which is legal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Back then, you couldn't have all this preseason practice like they have now. So uh, we ran a mile, and we were about, you remember, about eight, 900 people out there, maybe yeah. more than that. And we turned lights on around the football we had, we had, we, Yeah, we had the car lights Cars on. Cars, so nobody could cut the corner. And um, so I think it was Mo Howard the next year said, Coach, why don't we have a scrimmage at midnight? Instead mm -hmm. of running the mile, we'll do the mile later, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. And uh, so I said, yeah, that's a good idea. So we did. You were there. Yeah. And we had, what did we have the first year? We probably had 11,000, 12,000 yeah, people. Yes, there. Yeah. And then from then on, we filled it up and sold out. But I did it, and we did it, you know, mostly for the students. Yes. And that's why people now, I don't like the rule they got now, because they can start at 7 o'clock or something. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're going to do that because so the old people can come. But I, I, our original thing, as you recall, was to get the students fired up. Mm -hmm. And the students are just starting to roll at 12 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was... It is something that it amazes me. In fact, around here in Virginia Beach, they have midnight sales now. Mm -hmm. Midnight Madness sales are on 10 percent off or 50 percent off or whatever. So we should have gotten a patent on it. Yeah, yeah. But, but we didn't. And, Especially uh, the Midnight Madness uh, connotation. We'd have made a little money on that one. I know. That's what I'm saying. You know. You know. I, w I was thinking, coach, as I was preparing to meet with you that I look back over your years at Merle and, and you easily had over 25 high school All-Americans during your tenure there that you recruited the Albert Kings and the Brad. They've got to go on and on and on with the, um, you know, when you look back on it, Coach, what were some of the, the things that, that, uh, that you feel gave you an edge over other schools at getting getting these players to come because I mean you, it, it, you, no one can construe it as luck you, you you had too many great players at Maryland and so what was your recruiting formula well I guess I was always myself you know mm -hmm. I remember when I went in to talk to John Lucas First thing I did, said, what you got to eat in the refrigerator, Lou? So yeah. I go back and got me a Coke. And, yeah. You know, I, I try to make people feel at home. Mm. And, and, you know, I'm just a regular guy. I'm not some guy that's going to kill you or, mm. you know, in practice or cuss you out or whatever. And so I just tried to be myself and be, tell them, look, this is a great situation. Whether it was Davidson, it was academics, it was Maryland, it was, you know, it was the Washington, D.C. area. You know, you go to the Library of Congress and do research and, you know, go see Kennedy or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you know the deal. And so I think it was just, you know, my personality, I try to get them to respect me mm -hmm. and like me and, and feel like I was going to look out for them, you know, and be concerned about their academics and their basketball. I, I remember well, when I worked for you, Coach, and even after I left, you had gathered such a reputation, they would always say, boy, if Lefty gets in the home, it's over with. Cause they, they, everybody, you had the reputation of once you got in a home, you, you, you really had the ability to connect with the prospect and his parents. And, and, and they, once schools found out you were in the home, they got scared. Well, you know, some of that might have started when I was being recruited. Mm. Uh, like I told you, I wanted to go to Tennessee. My mother wanted me to go to, to Duke. Mm -hmm. It ended up, she put me in the car and drove me to Duke. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I said, well, you, first of all, you got to sell the mother. Mm -hmm. And then you got to sell the kid, too. Mm -hmm. But mostly, a lot of times, like Fred Hetzel's mother wanted him to go to, to, to uh, Davidson. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can't remember everybody we recruited at the mother 
ordered them to go, but mothers are closer to sons than fathers, yes. even in my family. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so if, if you can sell the mother and, and, and be honest, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I guess that was my secret. Although you tell you the truth, and you know this, we never, I never had recruited Dean Smith. I mean, Tom McMillan was the only one. That, yeah, I was the only one we ever beat George Carr, remember? Yeah. We had George Carr right on a piece of paper. Right, he was, was going to sign with yeah. us. You did that. We had him way up on the catwalk in Cole Fieldhouse and that. Yeah. McMillan was the only guy we ever beat him on. And, and I can remember. I mean, yeah. to tell you the truth, most he didn't really recruit Moses. He really didn't recruit Buck Williams. Yeah. Or, or he didn't recruit Lucas. Yeah. Because he, he made a statement that Lucas was a great tennis player and a good basketball player. Mm. So, you know, we were lucky that we got some people. But it, I think it was just because they trusted you and mm. they trusted me and mm. they, they knew that we were going to shoot them a whole lot of bull. Coach, when you look back on the years at Merlin, what, what, what is it that you're the proudest about? in your tenure at Merlin? Well, I'm proud of you. You know, my assistant coaches, yourself, mm -hmm. Joe Harrington, went on to be a good coach, and uh, uh, Oliver Purnell's done well, Ron Bradley. Uh, uh, I'll probably forget some of them, but Jim Maloney passed away, yeah, but he was a great coach. coach. And Then I'm proud of the what my players have done. 84% mm -hmm. of them, that stayed there for four years graduated. Mm -hmm. You know, that I'm not, I, I don't count people that transferred or went pro early, like mm -hmm. Brad Davis went pro early, uh, Buck Williams went pro early, mm -hmm. Harry Yates went pro early, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, I, I thought he made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But 84% uh, but of my players graduated and got a degree. And, and most of them are very successful. You know, Tom McMillan is the only Rhodes Scholar in the history of Maryland, mm -hmm. in the whole history of the school. Lynn Elmore graduated from Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there's never been another athlete from Maryland or the ACC that graduated from Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, Greg Manning was an academic All-American. So we had some, <coughs> some wonderful students that, uh, and you know, we had doctors there, Milroy and uh, um, Porak and Porak is a dentist. And so we had doctors, we had lawyers, we had NBA coaches, Lucas and, mm -hmm. and um, you know educators. Charlie Blank is a superintendent of the school somewhere. And mm -hmm. So we we I'm proud of what my players have done since they graduated. And, not, and like I said, 84 percent of them got a degree. As a matter of fact. Buck Williams came back and got a degree, mm. even though he only stayed there three years. Mm. And, and uh, uh, Larry Gibson came back and got his degree. Mm. Daryl Brown, you, yeah, you know, that was got one a of our original guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, Pittsburgh. He, he, he took a long time. Yeah, but, degree, he got but it. he finally got it. He finally got it. So uh, you know, I, I guess I'm most proud of the team, the teams that we had, and they were good students and nice young men and. Are very successful in life. That's that's what you try to do when you coach. The same way at Davidson. At Davidson, about forty percent of my players went to graduate school. And I had doctors and lawyers and admitted uh, D. G. Martin, who I was just talking to you about. It. He he was a vice president of the University of North Carolina. And so I'm I think I'm most proud of when I look back of what my players have done after they played basketball. And hopefully some of the things that you and I taught them about, you know, working hard and being a good person and so forth is, uh, has helped them be successful in life. Mm -hmm. Coach, I know this would be a, a difficult thing to do, but can you pick the top five guys you coached at Maryland? <laughs> no, I can't do that. I mean, people ask me that all the time, but I would see if I left somebody off, <laughs> then they'd be mad at me. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we look. Tom McMillan was a great player. Elmore, John Lucas, uh, uh, Brad Davis, uh, Albert King, uh, Leonard Byers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, and then some of the guys that didn't play that much, like 
little Billy Hahn. Mm -hmm. He never played that much, but he was a great leader. For yeah, he was in our first recruiting class. Yeah, you, you recruited him. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember we would come in at the half, and, you know, we'd stand outside and let them get a drink of water or something. Mm -hmm. I'd hear somebody in there hollering and screaming at the team. If, they weren't, if we weren't, it would be Billy. Yeah. Billy was fussing at everybody. Yeah. And even though he wasn't a great player for mm -hmm. us. He would, he helped us win because he Absolutely. was he was a great player, and we had a lot of players like that. I had a lot of players at Maryland and Davidson that were like that. You know, that were leaders and helped us lead the team and keep the guys in straight. Mm -hmm. Coach, how would you like to be remembered as the coach at the, uh, at, at, at the University of Maryland? You, you doing your tenure? How would you like to be remembered? I don't know, somebody came in and turned the program around. Mm -hmm. You know, they had only had one final top ten team in the history of the school since 1905 and only two 20-win seasons. Well, I think we were, you, we've been in the top ten your, what, third year? Third Second, year. Third, third year, year. Three one years, we've not been in the top ten. And, and, and I'm almost positive this is true because we were in the, at least in the final top ten every four years. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody that we recruited, you and my other assistant coaches, played on a final top ten team. And, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty good record, I think. And, and we went a tough league, you know, mm -hmm. North Carolina. And, and back then, Duke wasn't that tough. When you yeah. It was the State. 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 State was, yeah, it was Thompson and Burleson, and Monty Monty Cow, Cow. All those guys. I mean, it, it was a tough league. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, but that's that's what I remember is mm -hmm. getting us in the top ten and keeping us there. Even when I left, mm -hmm. you know, two years before I left, we went in the top ten, and and. Um, Oh, that, that's a hard thing to do. I don't care about all these regular season championships and if you went in the final top ten, you got pretty good team. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, coach, was there was there a, a prospect over your coaching year that you didn't get that you really kind of broke your heart? You worked your tail off to get them and you didn't get them. Well, the guy that I remember at. at um, well, of course, Moses Malone would be. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. But I got Moses. I got his signature on the letter of intent. But the guy that I really thought could help us win the national championship was Adrian Dantley. Because, mm -hmm. see, I mean, I became real good friends with his mother and his aunt, and that's who he lived with. And See, I, I wanted him real bad. Were you there then? No, I had left. You had left, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I felt he could guard David Thompson. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, kind of make it even to even. But so I was, you know, but when you're recruiting, you can't let something like that. I mean, look at all the people we lost. And, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you, I lost Phil Ford and Michael Jordan visited in Maryland. Mm -hmm. I lost him. He's a pretty good player. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was, it's hard to say, but the one that I think could have really helped us, of course, David Thompson could have helped us and Michael Jordan, all those guys, but you know, I just, I felt we had to, we had to get, because we had all the pieces of the puzzle except mm -hmm. somebody that they guard David Thompson. Because truth be known, Lucas ended up guarding Well, uh, to this day, I, 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 I accept the responsibility for not getting David Thompson because I, I, I that was the one time to this day that I feel, feel like I really let you down. I think... I remember early on in, the, in the, his senior year, you had come in the office one day and said, George, you need to get down there and see that Thompson boy. You know, my guys are telling me that he's really good. And, and, I, and I didn't really follow up on it the way I did. And by the time I finally got down and saw him play, I, I, the first game I see him play, he plays against a terrible team, and, and he's just scoring at will and dunking at will. And... And that, and I, I remember coming back and saying to you, Coach, uh, you said, well, did you go down and see that Thompson boy? And I said, yeah. And you said, well, what do you think? And I said, ah, he, he's just like a lot of those black kids in, in New York. He can dunk the ball and do all these things, but I'm not sure how good he really is. And, and, and so 
at that time, you know, I, I was shouldering a lot of the recruiting, and and I and I felt like that I let you down on that one. So, but I remember you. You probably don't remember this, but we were after David Thompson that that, that great freshman year. We were riding somewhere in the car, and I said to you, I said, Coach, I really feel bad about about this David Thompson thing and that, and you, with your quick wit, you said, that's okay, George, you, uh, don't worry about it, just give me one of them 25 guys from New York that can play just like him, <laughs> and that, but it was, that, that was my biggest, people ask me some time to time, what was your biggest recruiting failure? And I always say it was that, because I felt I let you down on that one. Yeah, but, and, but I've seen a lot of guys, you know, I've seen nights when I see Leonard Bias played, I say, the guy can't play. Yeah. You know, so guys have to, you, you only saw him once. Right? Yeah. So if you saw him two, three, four times, you you change. But I, I'm not sure we would have got him anyway, because Norman, <laughs> he yeah. violated a few rules. Yeah, but it was, it was, it was, but it was worth it. But, but we, one thing about us, we, we'd fight right down to, the, to our dying breath to, to oh, get him. Yeah. I used to always tell people, of, uh, a, a lot of things I admired about you, but one thing I I tell people I said I, one thing about Coach is he, he he had no quit in him. If you hit him and knocked him down, he'd get back up. You hit him again and he'd get back up. You hit him again and he'd get back up. And finally, he said, "Damn, I'm gonna have to kill Lefty. That's the only way I can end it." Because because <laughs> you were never you were you were. And that was one thing that uh, amongst many things that I learned from you is is persistence and. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time uh, that the, so many lessons I learned from you, the importance of reading, being organized, and, you know, I, I, I never appreciated organization as much until I started to work for you. And, 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 you, and a lot of the things to this day, I'm 75 years old, I look back on and the foundation started working for you. and. You know, every now and then when we talk or I send you a Christmas card, I always say thank you for the things you did for me. And I know you you just modestly brush them off, but but you you had uh, such a positive impact on my life, Coach. And and when you say you, you that's the thing you wanted to do with your players is I know if it rubbed off on me, it had to rub off on the players and, and all of us, I believe, are better people from being around you for the time that we're around because there's no way that person can be around you for a year or four years and, and not come away uh, uh, being a better person than when they first got in your presence. Well, you're making me sound better than I am. No, no, you are. you are. You are a slick guy yourself and a smart guy. And, and, you know, I remember that ad we put in, <laughs> and it, that was your idea then, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, we, 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 ran, we, we ran that ad in, in the Washington Post. It was, a, it was a play on the old Uncle Sam uh, a recruiting poster for the U.S. Army. And so we had Uncle Sam pointing, saying, we want you. But we took Uncle Sam and, and made him look like you, and then we, that's when we were after O'Brien and, and, and James Brown and Furtag, and was there another one? I know James Brown. Uh, yeah. Was, um, oh, he had a kid from Roosevelt High. Uh, he went. He ended up Lewis. 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 He went to two, went to Harvard. Two of those guys, and Lewis and, and James Brown ended up going to Harvard. Harvard yeah. And of course, we got we got O'Brien and Furtag. He uh, went to Boston he College. Went to Boston College. But, but, we, but we lost to Kennedy. Yeah, Kennedy's yeah. The Kennedys were the ones that Harvard. recruited him. <laughs> but uh, and I remember Howard Cosell used to do these Sunday evening radio programs where he'd do these little uh, essays, and and so. Uh, Howard Cosell on the Sunday thing says, oh, what is college basketball coming to? Now they're ever taking out full-page ads in the Washington <laughs> Post, uh, 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 recruiting players and that. And so, of course, it, it, it ended up being a, a big controversy. That, and the NC2A actually put a rule in yeah, after that. Yeah, we changed the rule. But you remember this, that ad... Everybody, it ran in the L.A. paper, it ran yeah. in the New York Times, yeah. it ran in every paper <laughs> over the country. Yeah. And, um, and, but it was legal. We checked it out. Right, so right. So we didn't break any rules, but as soon as rules. we did it, they changed. 
But they changed the rules. We got a lot of publicity out of that ad because right. it was in every paper in America. Because everybody said, this is, this is wrong. This and is then wrong. they started talking about it on the national news and yeah. everything. And then when <laughs> Howard Cosell picked it up, then we really got some publicity out of it. That was worth the publicity, yeah. <laughs> putting it in there. Hey, Coach, let me ask you this. If, if, if a young person was aspiring to go into college coaching today, and he came and, and sat with you and said, Coach, I'm thinking about uh, being a college basketball coach. What advice would you give him? Well, I got two grandsons that want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I just told them to work hard and, you know, believe in yourself and be a good person. And, mm -hmm. and you know, nowadays, George, a guy wants to get into college coach and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I didn't get in it for the money. Mm -hmm. Obviously, <laughs> you know, because when I went to Maryland, my salary was fourteen thousand. I don't know what yours was probably ten, right? Yeah, mine was ten, and when I left you and took the Washington State job in '72 as the head coach, I went there for twenty-two thousand five hundred. Hell, they paying these guys three, four million dollars. I know that's what I'm saying. It so it would be. I would tell them go after it because you might be end up a millionaire, you know, mm -hmm. multi-million. If you're good at it, mm -hmm. uh, just work hard and be honest, and you know follow the rules, and mm -hmm. just be a good, good motivator and a good person. And see, I, I think some of these coaches nowadays overcoach. You know, they tell you put this foot up, that foot up. I kind of in between doing that and Julie Kahn and, yeah. and Bill's story. I mean, I think you got to motivate people. It's not. You know, I never told them, but I did, I guess, I mean, might be more comfortable with this foot up or that foot up or just, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is relating to the players and, and get them to believe in it. Like, I hear everybody say, coaching is teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, I think coaching is as much selling as it I is agree. teaching. I agree. Because I got to sell you. <clears throat> I'm going to play man for man defense now. Well, my high school coach played his own. Okay, well, what, what am I going to say? Well, you got to do this or that. I say, look, that's what I believe. So a lot of it is motivating rather than it is teaching. Because mm -hmm. I, I hear coaches, oh, he's a great teacher, he's a great teacher. But I don't hear anybody say he's a great motivator. Mm -hmm. And you take Red R back. Mm -hmm. Red R was one of the greatest mm -hmm. motivators of all, all time. Yeah, I agree. And I was very, very good friends with Red, you know. and. Um, so I think some of these young coaches do too much coaching. You know, they're up calling to play this play, that play, this play. You know, tap you. You know, um, let them play. Don't don't restrict them. Mm -hmm. And mo motivate. Hey, we're gonna be the best team in the ACC or in the country. Or I think motivations, in my way of thinking, I was a better motivator than I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can teach them how to be a good person and this and that, but. Uh, as far as coaching is concerned, I would, and I think you were probably the same way. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, Coach Rizal, uh still lives in me to this day. You uh, things you talk. About.